God's grace and peace to you, friends. Today we are going to be exploring a story that happens right after our Pentecost story. The Holy Spirit has already come upon the people, though we won't celebrate it for a little bit yet. And Peter and John become uh, true apostles in the sense of being filled with the Holy Spirit doing the work of Jesus. It's an exciting and interesting story to think about. I'm glad you can join us for it. Would you join me in a moment of prayer, please? All of our power to do good comes from you, God. All our power to praise and pray both flows from you and is filled with your grace and mercy. The very gift of our lives comes from you, Holy One. Take us by the hand today. Raise us up to stand in your presence and fill us with wonder and amazement. In the name of Jesus Christ, who you raised from the dead. Amen. Let us sing together. Today's scripture comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him at the gate daily at the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms for those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, He asked them for alms. Peter looked at him intently, and so did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his eyes upon them, expecting to receive something from him. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Here ends our reading from the book of Acts. On the wings of a snow-white dove, he sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above. 
on the wings of a dove. When troubles surround us, when evil comes, the body grows weak. The spirit grows numb When these things beset us He doesn't forget us He sends down his love, down his love On the wings of a dove On the wings of a snow-white dove he sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above, on the wings of a dove. When Noah had drifted on the flood many days, he searched for land. In various ways Troubles he had some That he wasn't forgotten He sent down his love On the wings of a dove On the wings of a snow-white dove he sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above, on the wings of a dove, on the wings of a snow-white He sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above, on the wings of a dove On the wings of a dove On the wings of a dove So we're going to talk about this story in Acts, but I just want to acknowledge right off the bat that I'm going to gloss over some things that could be very huge issues to talk about because you can't talk about everything. First of all, I just want to point out that the ancient world looked very different than ours did. And in the ancient world, if you had a disability of some sort, they assumed that you were a flawed human or that you were cursed by God. I don't believe for a moment that this is true. I don't believe for a moment ever that God saw it this way. But even more so, I don't think this is what the story's actually about. I also want to point out that I'm not even going to talk about miracles or science or anything like that. Because again, I don't think that's actually what the story's about. So let's dig in. When I was doing a lot of retreats with camps, with kids, with adults, there was a game I liked to play. It didn't really have a name, but my shorthand was always the blindfold circle. What I'd do is I'd take some ropes, wrap them around a tree in a shape, a polygon, if you will, of some sort, and I would let everyone in, blindfolded into the circle, put everyone's hands on the rope, tie the rope tight so it was a big circle, not that they would know. And I'd lean to each one before they started and say, if you need help, all you have to do is ask. Nine times out of ten, they wandered around in circles over and over again, touching trees, bumping into people, trying to figure out what was going on, and no one would say a word because no one wanted to acknowledge what they needed to figure it out. It was the, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. I don't need help from anybody. So much so that I even had one kid go in circles at a camp for over a half an hour trying to figure it out. And I repeatedly asked, if you need help, I'm happy to help. You just have to ask. No, I got this, I got this. Why do we as people struggle so much to ask for what we need? 
to ask for help. So the people in this story, in this community in Jerusalem, would lie this man who was born lame from birth, it says. He couldn't walk. They would bring him to the beautiful gate of the temple and set him there so he could beg. He could beg for alms, charity from the people passing by. Immediately, questions popped into my head. Maybe you've had some similar as you heard the story. Did the man have a family to help? Was he even allowed in the temple? Why did he sit outside rather than worshiping with everyone else, going for prayers? Were there barriers for him to enter beyond that he couldn't walk? Did they make it inaccessible? Would they not allow him in as some would have done? Could the temple do nothing for him other than to just let him sit outside the gate and beg? Was no one willing to help this man other than to lug him and drop him off every day? Had he been begging his entire adult life since he was a kid? I'm going to let most of these questions lie because I can't really answer much of it. And to a certain extent, I'm not sure it actually has a whole lot of bearing on the point of this story. We read, when he saw Peter and John going to the temple, he asked them for alms, for a, a gift. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. This man's entire life has been boiled down to relying on the goodness of others to make sure that he had the basics of life, enough to survive. Not to thrive, but just to survive. Maybe you've met someone like this, who is fully reliant on other people for their well-being. Or maybe you've found yourself at times so reliant on others that it becomes hopeless to think you'll ever move past it. As in, you just can't imagine any other way that the world could exist except how it is at this given moment. This man, born lame from birth, cannot imagine a world where he doesn't beg for scraps. He can't even imagine asking for anything beyond the reality that he's currently living in. He encounters Peter and John, and they do this, what would Jesus do move, right? Jesus has just departed from them in the story and given them a task and says, and you will do what I did. They say, we don't have money because they didn't. Or like many of us do when someone asks for a handout of some sort, we're like, I don't have any cash. But they see him. They truly see who he is, not a man who is lame, not a man who is begging, but they see him as a child of God, not a burden. Peter offers the absolute unthinkable to this man. He says, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Peter invokes the name of Jesus and does that healing thing that Jesus told them they would do when they were filled by the Spirit. He sees the man for who he is, not his outward appearance, and he takes him by the hand and calls upon God to say, help this man. And a miracle takes place. Immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Beyond his absolute wildest dreams, the man finds healing and wholeness. It seems, though, the community around him was content with him to struggling where he was. They were content with the reality that one of their community struggled so hard and it was so far beyond their ability to help that they just left them, gave them scraps when they had it. And the reality is we do the same thing, especially with people we don't know how to or we're unwilling to help. I don't think most people do this out of malice. 
I don't think most people think it must be their fault and that's why they're struggling. Though if we're honest, we have probably had those thoughts. Well, I don't want to give him cash because he's going to buy booze. I'll admit that I've thought that many a time. The problem found for us, at least in the picture of this man, what needs to be fixed or helped with him is beyond our comprehension. And it's so much so that no one can fault you for giving up hope that somehow he can be healed. It's beyond our understanding. But as I said, I don't think it has much to do with the actual healing in this story. Not that it's not miraculous, not that there's not a lot to talk about in that, but I don't think it's the point. If I were diagnosing this community, and frankly us as well, my diagnosis would be that we struggle from a lack of imagination. I want you to take a second and think of some big problems that exist in our world. If you haven't thought of any, let me offer a few. Violence, inequity, hunger, climate change, sexism, homophobia, ableism, poverty, racism, or the scariest one of all, what is the future of the church? Do any of these just have easy, straightforward solutions? These are intractable problems. They're stubborn and obstinate. They don't go away. And they're complex issues that can't really be controlled or directed. In short, it is easy with these kind of problems to lead ourselves into denial or despair. And so often they do. Just recently, the World Happiness Report was published for 2024. It's a fascinating document with scientists across the world looking at how we relate to ourselves and how we find well-being. The data, though, this year was a little bit disconcerting. A trend was clearly established rather than just being supposed. The U.S. again dropped in ratings. We're down to number 23. The richest nation in the world is not even in the top 20 happiest of nations across the board. Generally, in most countries, the young are the happiest, followed by seniors, somewhere in that range, and then the middle-aged folks hmm, are the least happy. And it's pretty obvious. Kids don't have a lot of responsibility. Seniors ideally have gotten to the point where they're not worried as much about so many things. And the middle-aged folks have all the things like raising children and mortgages and all of those kind of things to deal with. And so, yeah, that makes sense to me. Probably makes sense to most of us. But the disturbing trend of late that is especially prevalent in this country, that the least happy group by a long shot are young people. Their group is roughly ages 15 to 24. And not by a little bit. It is significant, the gap. While the U.S. is 23rd overall, if you were to just look at the youngest group, 15 to 24, the people who should be riding high in the world, we would drop into the low 60s for ranking in the world. And there are plenty of reasons why most of the problems that cause despair and hopelessness for people, especially young people, come from some of these big, intractable problems in our society, in our world. Much like the beggar, our youth of today are losing hope at an alarming rate. They believe that their elders, middle age and above, are unwilling to try to fix the messes they've made, to even attempt working on the world's problems, saying, we've done our part, it's your problem now. The common sentiment kept coming about, well, the older generations took what they needed and they don't care enough about us to do any changes. They won't even let go of power. They suffer from a real, intractable set of problems and will continue to do so unless change happens. 
unless the way we do things in this world changes. I don't have a magic wand. I don't think God will magically fix all of the problems for us. I don't think there's any one group of people or age group or anything that can solve all of these messes we have created in this world over countless years. But I do believe another world is 100% possible. That when the prophets and Jesus tell us that God is doing something new, that when the angel tells Mary that anything is possible with God, that this is true to its very core. When Peter and John talk to this man and say, I don't have much to give, but what I do have, I will give to you. That this is how things change. This community around this disabled man had given up hope that anything could ever be done for him. They just accepted he has a disability. We don't know how to help him. We'll just let him be. They were willing to let him suffer because they had given up on the situation and they had given up on something different and just said, well, this is the way it's always been and this is the way it will always be. There's no hope. Nothing can change. It's just too much. Well, I humbly disagree. I won't pretend that I don't find disillusionment, despair some days. I won't pretend that I don't worry about the world my daughter will be living in after I'm long gone. I feel helpless some days that there is nothing that can be done and it's always going to be bad. But I also know something different that you know as well. Jesus looked at a world much like ours, at least in the way we feel about things, in the way the world was run by Rome and whatnot, and said, Death does not have the final word. I will not give in to despair. There's always hope. Jesus said that death and despair are not what's there. That love is if we're willing to work toward it. I don't have any easy solutions. There aren't any, and that's the point. But there are things you can do to contribute. There are things to do to keep you remembering that it doesn't have to be the way it is. You don't have to be the one waiting on others to change the world for you. You can start no matter your age or ability. Everyone can participate in this project. One thing I like among many others is what's known as the serenity prayer probably written by Reinhold Niebuhr in about 1930. It's become synonymous with Alcoholics Anonymous, among other groups, as a way to think about the world. If you don't know it, it reads like this. God, give me the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish from one another. There are hard, intractable problems in this world, but there are loving and brilliant people when they work together can change things. For nothing is impossible with God. This man had his life changed by the simple act of two people offering him a gift he didn't know he needed. They restored him, sure his physical, great, but they restored him to community and they restored him to hope. And if it's anything like any of the other people that Jesus took care of, they go and pour everything they have into helping others as well. It was written long ago, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Our call is to be a witness for the gospel of love. So what will your first step be? Amen. As we gather at your table as we
Let us be in a time of prayer. You have created us almost wonderfully, most beautifully, O oh God, with bodies and minds that you knit together, each different, and yet we belong together. You have even created your body most wonderfully too, bringing together your peoples into one community. This day we bring our joyous praise for all the ways you work within us, through us, among us, creating and recreating life even now. And we bring our prayers for all of those who've been excluded from communities, those whose bodies don't fit what we have decided is normal, those whose minds see something different than what we see, those who have been left out or overlooked or pushed to the side. May they all be seen in their glory and in their humanity made by you and loved by others as you already love them. This day we also bring our prayers for those places that intentionally or unintentionally are excluded. We ask for imagination and courage that we might make changes that make room for all people. We lift prayer today for those living with illness and disability, those who long for healing, and those who simply long to be accepted as who they are for those who are struggling with this health care system, we hope that they may find dignity and compassion. For those who are struggling silently, that they may find their voice. For those who have given up hope, let them find it. May all find new possibilities for health and wholeness and well-being. We also give thanks for all of those who work with health care and pray that they may serve others with energy and intelligence, imagination and love in your name. We lift prayers today for restoration, God, that our communities may be restored, that we may be restored to find hope, that we may be restored to find the life abundant you promised through Jesus Christ. Give us the confidence to share what we have, to lift others up and give what is most needed, to dig deep and take risks, to invite our neighbors by the hand that together we might find your healing grace already at work. We trust in your power far greater than our own God, and yet you promised to us joy, wonder, love beyond what we could possibly know. You do all this for us and through us and encourage us to do the same for others. And so we give thanks and pray as the one who taught us how to do this taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom 
the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, my friends, as you get ready to take that first step, maybe that first step is to take a pause and breathe, to be still and know that God is present with you. Maybe it is doing something little, like picking up that piece of garbage you walked by on the street. Whatever it is, I'm reminded of the words attributed to Mother Teresa. Not all of us can do great things. But we can all do small things with great love. Let us together take that first step to see, to know, and to love. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.